thousands and thousands of dollars. Okay? The classes have long laboratories. I, I would be up on campus 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night. And also the, the st stringency of like examinations. 80% pass rate. So that means if you take a test on something specific, you would have to pass with 80% or better. If you failed, even with a 79.9, right, you were offered a similar type test, again, on that subject matter. If you failed that, they would give you one more shot at taking the final retake. take If you missed that with a 79.9, they'd ask you to leave the program and say, go pick another field. You could be at the very end of your education. But who wants someone who's diagnosing you with cancer or whatever, or looking for cancer cells, that does C work or D work? Nobody, right? So they just hold a higher standard. Now, not to scare you, I'm the most average student, you know what I mean, in the world. So if I can do it, you can do it too. Okay? So just realize that it's, it's a tangible, you just have to apply yourself. Questions? Concerns? Concerns? Okay, Hayden so, had a question over here. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, what did you get on your exams? So I missed graduating with honors by one or two tenths of a percentage. So you had to have a three, three point five GPA, and I think at a four point, uh, a three point four seven or something like that. And it's because I bombed to a camp. I was taking, t I had to petition the dean, and I was taking twenty four credit hours to try to get into dental school. And uh, I did it to myself. So had I dropped that class and took it the next semester, I would have uh, graduated with, with honors from the, from the university. And a lot of us do because of uh, such high standards that we have. Um, and I'll kind of get into that a little bit. When we're done with our education, we would take a, 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 an ASAP comprehensive examination. And you need 60% to pass. But it's comprehensive, and it gets harder as you go on. So the more you feel like you're failing, the better off you're doing it. If it's getting really easy, you need to start worrying. It's kind of like the, uh, the nursing uh, test that they do. And then you have to do continuing education and renew that every three years, which I'm up for this next year. Okay, earnings. So medical laboratory assistant or a phlebotomist or specimen processor, um, this is what you get after your first semester. You can go and work in a hospital or a clinic doing these type of things and make some money. And then you can apply to the program and make some more money and while you're working your way through school, you can make more money when you graduate or going on to different fields, right? Trying to get into medical school or whatever. I can tell you that these numbers are low. They've actually increased, especially at the lower end, because the outlook for these has changed quite drastically, especially with COVID over the last two years and everything else. Things, things are changing. And we don't have all the answers yet, but they're going to change. Also, this is for Utah. You know what I mean? If you're working, this is at the upper end of, of the Utah pay scale, but if you're working in California or New York or some other places, and right now they have huge sign-up bonuses. If you're willing to move to like Michigan, they'll give you, a, I think, $15,000 or $10,000 sign-up bonus. So we're talking like, you know, Hey, Quinn, how much schooling is involved for a medical laboratory assistant? So this is the first semester. So um, if you go into the program and you do their phlebotomy and assisting program, um, you are technically, after that first year, as a, as a sophomore or a freshman, you're basically considered a medical laboratory assistant. So you could go find a hospital and work with them doing uh, laboratory assisting stuff. Or a CLA, which would be like a, a processor. Like, so. And is there a high need for that also? Uh, yeah, they, it's one of the highest turnovers. And that's one, one of the reasons why they're changing the, the pay scale is because it's very complicated. They touch every laboratory specimen that comes through. And we're losing these people very quickly. And I've been advocating with, with them to change the, the things so that people will stay here more. They tried to split it up because I can make to the hospital um, more revenue by doing sciencey stuff. So they stopped hiring medical laboratory scientists to process or set up the plates and stuff like that. And so they, there's a, a greater need for this. But a lot of nurses, a lot of uh, people going into other fields or radiology will come in and do specimen processing or medical or medical laboratory assisting to get their foot in the door. Now it won't get you the patient exposure depending on which field you're going in. Um, there is a PA school in Maine that will uh, take this as all patient care so that you can get into PA school. So that's a great question. So yeah, and within one year you, you have some, some technical skills. Within two more years 
you're actually an asset in the hospital, and then within two more years, you're, you're basically able to run the show. And what that means is um, you can go on with that four-year degree, and you can become like a supervisor, a manager, or your QA, or be a lead, like I am, okay? And that allows you to review stuff, uh, make reports from the medical director. Um, these earning incomes, so like a supervisor, manager, or a QA department might make or a technical consultant. What does might, QA stand for? Uh, quality assurance Thank you. department. Um, they might make, uh, you know, ninety-five thousand dollars, kind of like a professor. Okay. Whereas, like a director or a dean, could make up to six figures depending on what you're doing. Okay. Is that pretty good? Okay. So opportunities. I actually went to something called pre-professional. So you could go into medical laboratory sciences and just stay there. But I wanted to actually go to dental school. So I did all of the prerequisites for dental school, or medical school, or PA school, which is physician assisting school. I did it alongside my medical laboratory science degree. So when I was um, looking to uh, try and get through those extra classes, I was trying to get through, through dental school. So I did that, and I was applying while I was actually in school at my, it was, I prepared my junior year, and my senior year was all applications, basically, at that point. Uh, <clears throat> Most of my friends went on to medical school, dental school, PA school, uh, became professors or PhDs, to be honest. And then those that haven't went on to, this is called a laboratory information systems, which is uh, the computer, how the computer components talk to each other, or the servicing engineering field. So all these lights, lasers, um, pistons, probes, they actually uh, build and, and keep those things up and running. So if you have a technical mind and stuff like that, all I'm saying is, is there's lots of opportunities within this field. And I like the pre-professional route because if I feel stuck, I can move to another department, if that makes sense, or I can uh, keep moving on. LCMS is uh, liquid chromatography max spec. It's where we break apart uh, stuff like drugs to find out what kind of drugs you're actually on. Okay? I'm not saying that you guys can take drugs. Okay, so this is old. We were projecting back when I made this in 2028 that it was going to increase by 11%, and I can tell you that is low. That is very low. The aging population, a lot of my colleagues have been retiring, and then COVID broke out, and it has been very, very hard. And so some people just said, you know what, I'm done. I'm just going to retire uh, because it's not worth it. I'm going to, I'm going to do the other life things that I want to do. Technology, automation, legislation has changed a lot of that, right? Either with the Affordable Health Care Act. That was one thing that happened while I was in school, and it shifted people from going to med school to dental school, because those kind of go back and forth with how hard it is to get into. Or legislation such as like the COVID testing right now, right? So there's a huge change. And you probably haven't heard a lot about how much the laboratory field is suffering and needs people to actually step in to do that, okay? <clears throat> okay, so. Like I said, my department is mainly in chemistry, molecular, HIV, stuff like that. Um, my colleague would do body fluids and hematology and those things during our days. And we help each other out during lunch breaks and the analyzation and stuff like that. And as things come up and things are abnormal, we investigate those. And then we get uh, pathologists involved as necessary. And uh, blood typing, such as like if you have a mother, um, looking at their antibodies and their uh, blood type and stuff like that, uh, which you're all going to go through with this class, and there's just interesting things that we can do to help people. So I wanted to cover this last case study for you. Um, so here we have um, an adolescent who was born with pulmonary atresia. This is where the pulmonary arteries are stenosed, and they can't the, the valve didn't develop right due to a mid-sagittal defect. And she had a VSD, which is a ventricle septum defect with the chambers of the heart. Her unoxygenated blood and her oxygenated blood were mixing back and forth. This is a bad thing. But luckily, she had another genetic defect called a reverse oriented ductus arteriosus. So the bypass, such as the foramen of ovalum for mom breathing for baby, that bypass and this bypass duct, with it being reverse oriented, was shunting good oxygenated blood to her brain. So when she was born, we, the doctors had five extra days that we didn't think we were going to have to work on this patient. Okay? And they were able to look at everything and go in and <clears throat> sew in a patch to close off this PSD. And actually what they did is they did a conduit that plumbed from the ventricle up to the 
pulmonary artery to, to bypass that. Uh, during this case study, she actually had to have an upgrade because her blood volume and how her body was changing. This was too small. <clears throat> they needed to put in a, a balloon valve so that she could actually have the right oxygen carrying capacity, right? <clears throat> Turns out during surgery, they ended up, when they opened up her chest cavity, they nicked her lymphatic system and they were leaking uh, chylomicrons or lipids into her pleural space and it collapsed her lungs so she was life lighted up to uh, primary children's where they put a chest tube to actually suck the, the blood, or the, uh, get the color microns off of her and the lipids off of her, her body. And so the cool thing is, is during this surgery, what they did is they collected all the blood that she bled out during the surgery, and right after this picture, they put that in back into her body and she perked right up. But she's done just fine. This is my daughter. So when I look at like, like medical laboratory sciences, so all the hematocrits they did, all the CBCs, all the echocardiograms, there were fleets of teams of people who helped assist with my daughter. And I, I would have been a part of the team that I worked at that hospital to make sure that my daughter was good to go. She had a blood transfusion and everything, and so she's just doing well. So, yeah. Questions, concerns, insults? Thank you, guys. What's up? Can you breathe like a collapsed lung? Yes. So it's called a tension pneumothorax. It depends on how that collapsed lung is collapsed. So the chylomicrons, what happens is you have uh, fluid. There's a duct at the bottom of the pleural space. If you can give the body time, it can actually kind of absorb that and, and, and leak it out so it can get to the pancreas and be taken care of. But the other most common thing is with automobile accidents is a tension pneumothorax, which is air. So you get a puncture or a soldier would get a gunshot when you do a knife stab, right? And what happens is when your diaphragm goes down, instead of going all the way down your throat and inflating your air lungs and stuff like that, it's gonna go through passive least resistance, right? Diaphragm goes down, air goes in through here. It fills up that space like a balloon with air. Is air going to go down into your lung and inflate that lung? Not at all. So what we do, uh, or at least the EMTs, they'll take uh, a needle and actually do a chest decompression. There's a whole thing that you can do, but you can actually do a chest decompression either here, here, or here, and actually will vent off that, and the patient's lung will inflate immediately, and it'll. Um, survive. It's one of the three major uh, preventable causes of death and so I have actually a trauma unit in all of my cars that actually will treat for that. So yeah, great question. Any other questions? And it can be about anything. What's up? Oh, uh, what's your favorite part of your job? Uh, let's see. I love the science. Like the whole, like how the system in the field, and, like how the body relates to each other and that's what makes me so happy. I had a, a physician when I was a young medical scientist, and they, uh, they called me up and they're like, hey, I don't understand this leukemia or whatever, and I'm like, okay, but your sample's lipemic. So I got into the patient, and I saw that I had pancreatitis. So the pancreas was inflamed and couldn't produce what was needed to emulsify the flats to get that out of the bloodstream. So when we were shining the light through the sample, it was so cloudy, it was throwing off the results. And I'm like, doc, here's the thing. These are the chemical, the way that we're actually getting the chemistry, we can only give you these results. And he's like, because this is how we're running the test. And I, I, I can't treat that, but if you order these things, this is what we can do to get you those results. And he said, Quinn, that's awesome. So I watched for the next seven days, because I was seven months and off, and I saw them stop ordering the tests we couldn't run. They ordered the tests we could run. They treated the pancreatitis, saw the patient get better, and so patient get discharged. That's my favorite part. The hard thing is, is I feel like the laboratory sciences department, we've been further and further away from like the, the actual providers and the doctors. I had a doctor that talked to me last year who said like, hey, like, what's going on with this patient? I'm like, oh, well, we do all this investigation looking at the blood. He's like, I had no idea that you guys do that much analysis. I'm like, no, we have to do that on every single patient. And so that's the disconnect. And so I'm hoping it will change. They could hopefully go more clinical with us, or what they will probably do is go more technical with us and split us further apart, but we'll see what happens. But we don't have to deal with angry patients, which is nice. Have a good day. All right. Hey, happy Friday. Woo! Thanks, Quinn. Oh, these have QR codes for the different uh, programs if you guys want to take a quick picture of this.